Hi, and welcome back everyone. Today we're going to continue that very important work that we mentioned on yesterday. Do you remember we said that after all of the things that we've learned this year in reading, our reading really becomes important to us when we have reading comprehension. And comprehension, we said, means to understand. So if we want our stories to really have meaning for us, if we really want to get the essence or the importance of what the author intended when she or he wrote it, if we want to capture all of that, we have to understand what it is we're reading. Well, we have strategies, strategies that we put in place to help us understand and gain meaning from our stories. Some of those we talked about earlier in the year and we mentioned them yesterday. Making connections, text to text, text to world, text to self. We also said that other strategies we use can be predicting and we talked about that one extensively too. It means that we use clues from the story to say what we think is going to happen next in the story. What makes sense? What's logical? Then yesterday, we talked about one of the big ones, and that strategy from yesterday was envisioning. We said that sometimes when you're reading, especially when books do not have vivid pictures, we have to make a movie or picture in our minds of what's going on as we read. Well, today, we have another important strategy, and this is absolutely one of the biggest ones, and it's also a very difficult one at times. And that is the strategy of inferring. So to infer means to conclude or figure out something that's going on in the story based on our schema and based on other happenings in the story. What has happened so far, clues that the author is leaving, what's going on with the characters, and there are different ways that we can infer. We can infer very simply from pictures. Some books, especially those that are maybe a little easier for us to read, they help us to infer by giving us picture clues. So we can tell what's happening in the story and tell what the true meaning is or conclude what might be going on, sometimes based simply on the picture. Let's look at a quick example. Here's a little story. This little story is called The Fair. And let's just read the first couple of pages and you'll see what I mean by a very simple inference or very simple way of inferring. The Fair. I've saved my dimes to go to the fair, says Pete. I'll go today. Dave, May, and Rosa say they'll go. They'll be here at three. We'll ride the train to the fair. So of course I can infer something very simple that probably these other kids are his friends, maybe from school, maybe from the neighborhood, but they're all going to go to this fair together. So I'm assuming or thinking that they must be friends because when you want to do something enjoyable and fun or exciting, we like to do those things with people that we enjoy and we want to be around, such as our friends. So this is a very quick inference. I'm inferring or thinking or concluding that these kids must be his close friends. But let's read a little bit more. Here we are, Pete says Dave. Time to go, don't be slow. They leave right away and go to the train. Rosa shows Pete the way to go. I want you to look at this picture for a moment. And here are the friends. Now, we don't have to really infer. We can tell um, which one is Pete, okay? He's the one we saw in the beginning of the story and said he was gonna save his dimes. So we know who Pete is. And then we see Rosa and Dave and the others, you know, and they're all together here. So I know they're friends and I see that they're waiting for the train. That's obvious, isn't it? Because the picture's letting me know that the train is about to come. This because number one, they said they're going to take the train and then I see the train tracks so I know that the train is probably coming soon. But now there's something else. The train goes right to the fair. Pete, Dave, May, and Rosa leave the train and meet Gail. 
She's at the gate near the rides. Here are the rides, says Rosa. We'll try the airplane ride. The airplanes fly high and low. Pete, Dave, excuse me, Dave, Pete, May, Rosa, and Gail like the airplane ride. Who in this story is Gail? Can you tell who is Gail? Well, we can make a very simple inference here. I know that this little girl here must be Gail. Now, how do I know that? Well, the story begins and it's just Pete. Then he says he's going to meet his other friends and they come along. And we see all of his friends on the other page. And then it says they meet Gail. Well, here is a new character, Gail, who wasn't in the other picture. So then I can infer or conclude, hey, this must be Gail. That's simple, what? that was simple, wasn't it? So sometimes very simple inferences are made as we read. I'm making a very simple inference as to who this little girl is right here. Who must be Gail? She's the one that joins them in the story. And when I turn the page, I see them again. And who do I see? The same four in the beginning. And then this must be Gail because she wasn't with them when they first left. So inferring, inferring, excuse me, can be very, very simple. And the pictures can help us make these inferences or these conclusions about the story, about the characters, simple things. Then we have other kinds of inferences where it's not based on the picture, but based on things we know from our schema. You remember when we read Splat the Cat? There he is, look at poor Splat. Remember it was his first day of cat school? And it says, it was early in the morning and Splat was wide awake. Today was his first day at cat school and his tail wiggled wildly with worry. Now, as we read the story, we see that Splat doesn't want to go. He starts making up excuses about his hair and, and the fence and all the things in the house won't let him go. He makes excuse after excuse after excuse. So, quite naturally, we infer that he is afraid to go to school. It even t tells us that he's worried in the beginning. But the story never tells us exactly why Splat does not want to go to school. But we're going to make an inference or we're going to draw a conclusion, as we say, as to why he doesn't want to go. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that one based on our schema. The first one we did based on, our, on the pictures. This story never really clearly says why. It just keeps showing his hesitation or his not wanting to go to school. So we have to think, why could that be? So I'm thinking, hmm. It's the very first day, so he's probably nervous because he doesn't know how it's going to be, or maybe he's wondering if he's going to make a friend, or maybe he's wondering if he's going to uh, have fun. Maybe he's wondering if anyone's going to like him. Maybe he's wondering if he's going to get lost, or maybe if his teacher's going to be mean and scary. We really don't know, but we can infer these things based on our own knowledge, our own schema, our own experiences. So we can use pictures in the story to help us um, make inferences. We can use our own schema or ideas or experiences that we've had making those connections as to why Splat might be afraid to go to school. All of those are ways we make inferences as we read. Well, let's go a little deeper. Here is this tale of Despero one more time. I'm going to quickly read this chapter. Chapter six, this drum. And we're gonna talk about what I'm inferring or what I'm concluding based on what I see or hear happening in the story. Ready? He cannot, he simply cannot be my son, Lester said. He clutched his whiskers with his front paws and shook his head from side to side in despair. Of course he is your son, said Antoinette. What do you mean he is not your son? This is a ridiculous statement. Why must you always make the ridiculous statements? You, said Lester, this is your fault. 
The French blood in him has made him crazy. C'est moi, said Antoinette. C'est moi? Why must it always be I who takes the blame? If your son is such the disappointment, it is as much your fault as mine. Something must be done, said Lester. He pulled on a whisker so hard that it came loose. He waved the whisker over his head. He pointed at his wife. He will be the end of us all, he shouted, sitting at the foot of a human king. Unbelievable, unthinkable. Oh, so dramatic, said Antoinette. She held out one paw and studied her painted nails. He is a small mouse. How much of the harm can he do? If there is one thing I have learned in this world, said Lester, it is that mice must act like mice or else there is bound to be trouble. I will call a special meeting of the mouse council. Together we will decide what must be done. Oh, said Antoinette, you and this council of the mouse, it is a waste of the time in my opinion. Don't you understand, shouted Lester, he must be punished. He must be brought up before the tribunal. He pushed past her and dug furiously through a pile of paper scraps until he uncovered a thimble with a piece of leather stretched across its opening. Oh, please, said Antoinette. She covered her ears. Not this drum of the council of the mouse. Yes, said Lester, the drum. He held it up high above his head, first to the north, and then to the south, and then to the east, and then to the west. He lowered it and turned his back to his wife and closed his eyes and took a deep breath and began to beat the drum slowly. One long beat with his tail, two staccato beats with his paws. Boom, ta ta, boom, ta ta, boom, ta ta. The rhythm of the drum was a signal for the members of the mouse council. Boom, ta ta, boom, ta ta, boom. The beating of the drum let them know that an important decision would have to be made, one that affected the safety and well-being of the entire mouse community. Boom, ta ta, boom, ta ta, boom. Now, I am curious. I must stop right here and do some work on inferring. I have to sit here and think to myself, what's going on? I know that Despero's brother saw him, saw saw him at the foot of the king and was listening to the music and saw the princess touching him. I, I remember all of that. And I remember that Furlough said he must run home and tell his father. Well, that has happened. And now his father is all in a tizzy. He's very upset. But why exactly? Well, the story does give us some clues. He says that mice have to act like mice or there's going to be some trouble. So I have to go back into the story and I have to find those moments or those clues that kind of help me infer. So it says, if there's one thing that I have learned in this world, said Lester, it is that mice must act like mice or else there is bound to be trouble. So he's going to call the special meeting. And his mother says it's going to be the death of us all. What does that mean? Well, how can one little mouse, by listening to music or sitting at the foot of the king, cause trouble for an entire mouse community? So this is where I'm using their panic in the story, along with my understanding of mice, to try to figure this out. I am thinking, I'm thinking so far that perhaps Despero's presence in front of the king and the princess, letting them see him, well, we know it put him in danger because she could have screamed and said, ah, a mouse, and they could have tried to kill poor Despero, but that's not what happened. But the other mice, they know that people try to catch and kill mice. So maybe they're thinking that Despero's presence there is going to let them know, hey, there are mice in the palace. And maybe they're going to have to do something about those mice to get rid of them. That's what I'm thinking so far. That's what I'm concluding based on their reaction. Their reaction is so strong. They're so terrified. They're so worried that the father is calling together all of the mice of the mouse council to make a decision as to what must be done about poor Despero. They feel he must be punished. 
And I'm thinking that they're doing this because they think that because the humans have seen him, now all of the mice are in danger of being captured or killed. That's, that's what I'm inferring from the story so far. Now, as we read along, we're going to find out more information that's going to tell me whether or not I'm thinking in the right direction. But right now, I can conclude that or think that must be what's happening based on their panic in the story, the clues the author gives, based on my schema, what I know about mice and people, all of those things put together are helping me infer, conclude what must be going on or what the characters are thinking or what this whole situation is about. So you can do this hard work too. And it is hard work sometimes, but the pictures can help us. Sometimes the text can help us. Sometimes our schema can help us. We need to pull all of those things together when we begin the hard work of inferring what we think the author means or meant in a particular part of the story. So let's do that today. Get your stories, and it could be any story, but all stories don't lend themselves to inferring the way that these do. But you can, from the pictures, your schema, or from the clues in the text, kind of do a little bit of this work. Let's just try it on today. Read a little ways, and you're not predicting what you think is going to happen, but you're taking what has already happened, and this time, instead of saying, huh, next I think, this time you're saying, they're thinking this way because... They feel this way because you are forming in your mind the reasons why something is happening. That's what we're doing when we, are, when we are inferring. We're formulating or making those reasons in our mind as to why things are going a particular way in the story. So give it a try. And we'll talk about this a little bit more and get into another strategy on tomorrow. Reading comprehension is hard work, but it's what brings stories alive. It's what helps us grow as readers. So we're going to do our best, okay? Give it a try, and we'll talk soon.